but sometimes the question can be subtle enough or just slightly beyond a mere technical answer that you should really be asking me. And uh, like I said, the easiest way is just to do that and ask you to have some time. But uh, you can always come by in my office by just mailing you know, or swinging by. OK. Uh, where were we? So we saw that uh, the self energy turned out to be e minus 4 i g squared. It had some expressions. They were almost meaningless because they are infinity. But they are so close to the thing that we are eventually going to say it's meaningful. So the fact that these things are infinite um, should disturb you, because what, what step could we do wrong? Um, in a sense, we are sort of, at first pass, you know, in the deep sense, what's going to turn out to be the case is that the infinity that we're hearing, he seeing here is as, um, Sorry. <laughs> is as dumb as uh, Zeno's paradox. So you may all know Zeno's paradox, saying if I want to walk from this end of the room to this end of the room, I first have to walk halfway. But before I do that, I have to walk a quarter way. But before I do that, I at least have to have made it to an eighth of the way. And there's so many steps there, it would take me forever to get to the other side of the room. And infinity has hit us. Now, none of us falls for that trick or that paradox nowadays. Um, but it turns out that in a deep way, this, the infinities that you're just seeing here are because we have secretly fallen into this trap. Okay, so somewhere there's a way of phrasing the problem where, where you would laugh at the infinity here as much as you would laugh at Zeno's paradox being phrased. But right now we are not got that insight. We are not laughing. Uh, it looks bad. Now, even Zeno's paradox, he could have at least done the first step. If he could only imagine that time and space were somehow discretized, there is no such thing as a continuous time step or a continuous movement in space. You have to just do discrete things. He might have stopped and said, well, you know, there is no fraction smaller than 1 8, so I can't talk about the 1 16th step. He could have, in that sense, stopped himself. Um, it's because of his mathematical conception of a continuous space and time that, that he first even could raise the issue. Not that he was wrong to think of continuous space and time. The, the resolution of his problem is not that space and time are discrete. That's not a necess necessary consequence of the paradox. The same is true here. It's secretly there's a deep reason why we're seeing the infinities that we're seeing here, and 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 they're not really there in some sense, right? Just like Zeno's paradox. Um, but we, since we lack that insight, we can at least try and uh, discretize our way out of the problem or, or just change our, pick, our view of the case and time here too. Now, what we're going to do, I'm not going to do it just this instant, but in 10 minutes or so, is we're going to just cut off the integral. So if it's getting bad when the q's get go to infinity and the 
business is looking poorly behaved, well, don't let them go to infinity. Okay? That's what we're going to do as just a way of at least pausing and staring at least. It's no longer a physically sensible thing to do. Who told you to do that? But it's at least mathematically sensible. We can continue to stare at this without getting too scared. So we're going to do that. So if you want, you can already start to say, well, that's, that's how I'm about to manipulate the expression. But um, before worrying about that, I want to massage this in form that's useful, okay? And then you'll, then, uh, and, and then we can imagine repeating every step that I've done until now with this in place, okay? But I don't want to get into that. So just pretend it converged, okay? Pretend you didn't notice that it was so bad. Um, but still, even if this was a convergent integral, how am I supposed to do this integral? What tricks do we have to make it easier? So that's where I want to start before I worry about all the infinities. I just want to say, even if it was not infinite, what would I do? For example, if you lived in two plus one dimensional space time, this would be like this. Then this would at least have more cues up, more cues on the bottom than on the top. And you would imagine, and you'd be right, that if you integrated to large Q, this would convert. So it seems like it's only a coincidence that things have been so bad to us. Uh, if you actually rewrite quantum mechanics in the language of high-tech quantum field theory Feynman diagrams, then this would have been just that. That's why you never see, or hardly ever see, the divergences in quantum mechanics perturbation theory. Because even this one, you just put a one there, no space, there's only time. Um, that's it, right? Uh, it's converted. The, uh, the analogy is, if you like, that quantum field theory is like an infinite number of coupled harmonic oscillators, not five harmonic oscillators. It's the infinite that's giving this infinity here. Okay, so with that excuse, let's keep going. So one, one standard trick for massaging integrals, especially of this form, um, is Feynman parameterization of, of these loop integrals. Okay. And it's just this trick. The fact that these two propagators carry different momentum dependence inside them, uh, it makes this a harder integral. If only I was facing this, I could actually shift the Q by an amount P, and I would just get something which is P independent. See that? That wouldn't be so bad. That would be like the other integral. At least it's just a constant. It doesn't depend on P. So whatever it is, it's just a number. If I could only, if I only had this integral to do, this would actually be P independent, this integral. This one would also only be P integral. It's because they're intertwined in this way that there's trouble. So Feynman's trick is to figure out how to disintertwine these two guys. Here's the trick. This is just a parameter. It is not space. It turns a product A and B into a sum. Now, this is just a very simple exercise. You can do it. You know how to do that integral. Go ahead and do it. And you'll check that when you put in the integration limits, it's just this. Okay? <clears throat> so that's the trick. So for us, this integral is just the integral dx, 0 to 1, 1 over squared 1 minus x squared 1 minus x plus mm -hmm. 
Now um, we can, so there's a Q squared here, but there's also a sort of Q squared right there. So let me just uh, collect as many things as I can. Oh, this is a capital M squared. I'm using capital M for the fermion mass and little m for the scalar mass. By the way, is it fair to say that the camera can get this? I think so. I think so. But as a general principle, general rule, yes. keep slightly bigger fonts, yes. Well, as a general rule, I will explain for this moment. <laughs> uh, so this is q squared minus m squared. So they are written in a simpler form. Now, again, if only I had integrals where it's constant stuff and the q dependence is like q plus something all squared, then I can just shift the integration variables and just make it q. But I don't have that situation here. I have a q squared and I have a p dot q x, so it's not just a complete square. That's easy, just complete the square, okay? So, um, I don't know how you're going to write it in the books, but. Wait, did I? Uh, two to the minus two. Minus two. Here it's just q minus px squared plus minus m squared plus p squared x minus p squared and x squared. So I just completed the square, which made a mistake of p squared x squared, but then I removed that mistake. So this is it. And now you can see that the obvious thing to do is to change variables to Q. And then the integral will become much, much, much simpler. our minds, but you can, I mean, I'm just doing this field redefinition. I'm just going to write it as, down, I'm going to just write it as Q squared. Okay. Um, how do we do that integral? Um, well, even this one, if only this was a sort of standard integral that we're used to in Euclidean three-dimensional space, we'd all know, you see, it only depends on q squared. So that's pretty handy. We just have to use polar coordinates. But oops, we are not in Euclidean space. We're in Lorentzian space time. So I can't use polar coordinates and attack this. If only we could turn it into a Euclidean problem, then I could use polar space and time. And the way to do that is what's, it, 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 to turn a Lorentzian problem into a Euclidean problem is, is known as there's wick contraction, that's something else. Wick rotation. And it involves just doing an analytic, uh, sorry, doing a contour rotation in the Q0, the energy complex plane. So let's just see how that works. So right now, so focus, we're focused on integral d q zero. Let's keep the spatial integrals out the front, undone. I only want to do this integral, okay, for a start. I want to imagine doing this integral. And so I'm drawing the q zero complex plane, a 
course, I'm supposed to just integrate real q0, right? So I'm just supposed to do this integral. That's my contour. Nothing complex about it. However, we can analyze where the poles are in this uh, one. Okay, this. There are poles in Q0 sitting here, and you can see where they are. Um, there are poles here and here where, so the poles are at Q0 equals plus or minus the square root of m squared minus e squared x, 1 minus x, minus or plus an i epsilon. Plus or minus are correlated in this way. You can easily see that off the top of your head if you look over here. But it's only true that they look like this. This, this is only true if this thing is real, if this square root is real. Then it looks like this. If this square root was imaginary, it would look some, some other way. So what is that saying? What am I saying when I say the square root is, is real? So we're going to take um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the momentum through p to be in the broad vicinity. I don't mean very close, I just mean in the, let me take it in the broad vicinity of the scalar mass, okay? This momentum that's coming through the line. And, um, and let me further take the mass of the fermion to be uh, greater, sorry, let me, let me take m to be uh, less than, less than, two times the fermion mass, okay? Uh, so this implies that the square root is real. Exercise, check for yourself. The biggest that x times one minus x can be is a quarter, okay? Simple. If that's a quarter, and and little p squared is like little m squared, then if you satisfy this inequality, this, uh, this square root is going to be square root of a positive number. OK? So, so simple statement. Now, that seems like some perverse choice. I just chose to study that case. Is there any physical significance? Yes, and we're going to study the other case after we study this case. But the physical significance is very easy. That is, phi can't decay to psi plus psi. <coughs> Why this diagram cares is a deep question. We'll come to it. But just note, is there some relevance of this inequality that you could have guessed off the top of your head? Yes, a particle of mass little m cannot decay to a particle of mass m capital M plus capital M, kinematically forbidden if this is true. Okay. So the deep relevance of what it means when it's not true and it can decay, we'll get to later. But right now, I'm taking the non-decaying phi particle case. Okay. Um, if p squared was very far from m squared, then in fact, again, it might be impossible to take this example. And then we, 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 would, we would not have the pole structure that I'm drawing, and we'd have to treat it differently. Okay? But let's just do this example. Okay? Um, but, but this is the physical significance of that example. A nearly on shell phi, which however cannot decay kinematically, it's stable, and, and this is what we're studying. Um, so the trick is simply this. If we can just take this axis, this, this contour, and if we can rotate it into this contour, turn it into this contour, then we will be in, we will be integrating on the imaginary energy axis. OK? 
Okay? And the, the strategy is that right now we're struggling because the signature, so Q squared, whenever we see Q squared, it really means Q0 squared minus Q vector squared. But if we could sort of integrate here, then it would look like some sort of an overall minus sign and then a four-dimensional Euclidean construction for which we are masters of polar coordinates and all those tricks, okay? So that's the game plan. Uh, so let's see how that works. And um, I'll just comment that it seems to me a very deep fact. This is just a technical trick. This Euclidean space that you get by making Q0 imaginary and getting something that looks like it's just a four-dimensional Euclidean space. It's just a math trick for solving this problem in a simple way. But the fact that it's possible seems to me, and I think maybe many people in the world, to be a rather deep fact. What is this small sign that connects Euclidean and Lorentzian space-time? Uh, why is it so efficient to calculate the Euclidean space using this trick? It's, there's got to be a deeper story. But as you keep going in the subject, you're going to keep seeing the Euclidean hiding behind the Lorentzian. And you're going to keep wondering, is there more to this than that? And the more you go, the more striking it becomes. All these places where it leaks out that there's some Euclidean side there. It's also the connection between the deep analogy between statistical mechanics, partition functions, if you like, and quantum field theory. There's a deep analogy, and it's based on this Lorentzian similarity. Anyway, right now we're just looking for a math trick so that we don't have to learn something about Lorentzian intervals. Um, what is it? Um, so the idea is the idea is to simply take this contour. So I'm going out to infinity I'm going out near infinity for a very large radius. I'm not I'm assuming you've seen things like this in complex analysis courses, so I'm not Stating, let's take a big go out to R, this is being sloppy. We're going out to infinity, and we're considering this closed, uh, this closed contour. Okay, so here it is, nice closed contour. There's no poles in it, and so it is zero. Okay, that integral is zero. But these pieces here. I'm assuming, but I will prove in a second. I'm assuming that the contributions, that these contributions at infinite radius go to zero, as in all good problems they should. Um, you might say, why not? this integral dq q to do. And I'm putting it to the side. As if we were doing quantum mechanics and we only had to do an integral over n to where everything would be finite. Okay? So anyway, as far as doing the integral dq0 is concerned, keeping all the other integrals left remaining to be done, uh, the integrand is dropping like 1 over q0 squared. And so I can run this argument. just have to do the integral this way, which is of course the opposite of that. Um, so let's just write down the answer. What was it I was calculating again? Sigma. Uh, so sigma is equal to minus So I'm actually using going to use the same trick on this guy too. I'm actually going to use the same trick on this guy. So you can see it's easy enough. 
So doing it on both, I get uh, so on that first term, this extra i is because of the fact that it's the imaginary axis that I'm using. Okay. The, the minus is because instead of giving me q Euclidean squared, I'm getting minus q Euclidean squared. Uh, so you can do you can check q Euclidean squared. I probably made a mistake, so check the sign. Uh, and then, and then there's this other term, from the more complicated integral. V squared, V extra I integral V four Q Euclidean. So you all see that what I'm doing is I'm taking this imaginary integral here, calling it. So uh, this in this trick, we're we're saying. Because we're trying to do this, we're defining this thing called Q4, which equals I Q0. Okay? So we're thinking of it as a fourth Euclidean direction. And that's what I'm writing here. Okay? And that I is the thing that's, that's, that's showing up here. Um, integral dx. sort of a price to pay for the Feynman trick, which is, you can't forget that two there. there it's so it's, 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 it's not like a regular Q, 1 over Q squared, it's a 1 over Q squared squared. That's it. Okay, so now just clean up a little bit. Minus 4G squared. Where, again, just since this is the first time I used it, Q Euclidean corresponds to Q vector and Q form. 